Pete Law, I'm speaking, chair of the, uh, of the Smoke Committee, um, NWCU Smoke Committee, and I wanted to welcome you all to a webinar on southeastern emission factors. Um, I heard Kevin speak at the um, AFE Fire Congress and thought that as we um, within the Smoke Committee, as well as um, as we also are um, at the in the topic subcommittee, trying to really figure out what we're doing in terms of uh, emission factors and, and where they go and, and their evolution, um, that it would be valuable for us to, to hear Kevin. Um, kind of push the pace a little bit to have him do the presentation today because we will be having a fairly significant dialogue next week at the IAWF Fuels Conference where there is a literally a full day panel with many presentations on this topic and dialogue afterwards to try and figure out some next steps. Kevin, I wanted you included in some of that dialogue um, by setting us up with some of your stuff today. So I sure appreciate your willingness, and Liz, your willingness to step in for Blaine. Um, and, uh, that's a, a real, you know, real boon to us to, to help out and move forward. On. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate everybody attending this webinar. I say that this uh, research is a collaborative effort between myself and Dr. Yu Ping Shea, who's at Florida A&M University, and his postdoc, Dr. Glennis Bugna. Uh, they have more of the background in uh, atmospheric chemistry, environmental chemistry, and my background is more uh, in ecology, and fire ecology specifically. Um, okay, here we go. Okay, and just the background, of course, to know that uh, combustion of carbohydrates produces lots of different uh, emission products, and one that uh, we're concerned with typically is, is particulate matter because of its being regulated by the uh, EPA, in particular PM 2.5 or particles smaller than 2.5 microns. Um, certainly not the only one of concern, but the one we'll focus on today. And so PM emission factors are simply the amount of particulate matter emitted per fuel consumed during a fire. And as probably everyone in this group knows, it's an important part of this uh, overall process for for uh, developing emissions inventories where we take the burned area and multiply that times fuel loading and then times fuel consumption and then here's the emission factor where it tells us uh, you know it's a number of how much emissions there are per fuel consumed and then of course we might be interested in how rapidly emissions are being produced and where the emissions go but obviously this number that we use uh, for emission factors for whatever emission we're talking about is very important in these overall inventories. And from you know Tall Timber's perspective, it's important from a conservation per perspective because we want to make sure that the um, agencies that are regulate, regulating prescribed burning are, are, are getting numbers that are as close as to real ones as possible for uh, appropriate science-based regulation. Uh, some different factors that could potentially influence emission factors, which was sort of the impetus for um, for this study, or of course the combustion phase, whether it's flaming or smoldering or glowing combustion, which is uh, inversely, well, is related to combustion efficiency or amount of carbon dioxide release per carbon monoxide and other carbonaceous products. Uh, fuel moisture has been found in the past to increase emission factors. Both density is generally the higher the, um, the packing ratio and the less oxygen available the efficiency decreases and emission factors should go up. Fuel composition is what kind of plants, chemistry, fire behavior. And these um, more direct variables kind of feed into more general environmental variables such as community type, season of burn, the weather during the burn time since fire, and these are just to name a few. And we know from past research like this, uh, this um, review by Urbanski et al. that Different overall community types have, have different uh, emission factors, or here's modified combustion efficiency, which is generally inversely related to emission factors. And here we are up in this uh, more of a grassland habitat, you know, the longleaf pine, uh, shortleaf pine, oak hickory forest in the southeast are, are mostly fueled by grass, but also pine needles. So the overall purpose of this study was to investigate effects of, of the fire environmental conditions and ecological variables that might influence uh, particulate matter 2.5 emission factors, and all of these are within southeastern pine grassland communities. When I say pine grassland, I mean uh, tree canopies that are lower than about 50% cover so that there's enough light on the ground to support uh, herbaceous 
ground cover that's pretty continuous and carries frequent fires or, or is maintained by frequent fires. And one of our purposes is to suggest whether or not developing models to predict these emission factors uh, might improve models for, for, for um, predicting emission estimates in the future. So the, the scope of this study was not to produce a model. We just didn't do enough empirical research to do that, but really just to kind of look into this question of whether or not it might be worthwhile to do so given the amount of um, variance in emission factors we have within the uh, typical range of conditions that we do prescribe burning in the southeast. So uh, our study was conducted at both Tall Timbers Research Station just on the Florida line and also at Pebble Hill Plantation just across the line in Georgia in a combination of uh, old field um, loblolly pine shortleaf pine grasslands and also native longleaf pine wiregrass. And our methods were basically to measure um, PM2.5 emission factors in the field from the ground so we don't have towers or airplanes. Uh, over a range of common environmental conditions, and then to use structural equation modeling to identify variables that, that seem to be uh, correlated with, with emission factors and in, in their interactions. So some of the variables that we measured in the field included fuel load and moisture and com consumption variables. So um, you know, how much was live, how much was dead, uh, how much was in one hour versus 10 hour fuels, how much was uh, more or less semi-decomposed duff on the ground versus aerated fuels, bed depth and density, time since fire. And our time since fires range from one to four years since previous fire. And four is getting pretty close to the upper end that would maintain this as a pine grassland community. Fire behavior, uh, we measured this typical list, you know, heat per unit area, reaction intensity, fire line intensity, or smoldering and flaming residence times. Um, and I won't go into the details about how we measured all these variables. Some of them are observational, like flame length, but um, otherwise we use very thin thermocouple wires to to uh, measure flaming residence time and then uh, rates of spread between one point and another when we lit these different fires, mostly in research plots, to, to make all these calculations. We measured fuel before and after the fire to estimate uh, fuel consumption, and from those we're able to calculate heat per unit area, reaction intensity, fire line intensity. And we split it between backfires and headfires. Fire environmental variables, we, you know, this list of rel relative humidity, ambient temperature, keach bound biome drought index. We spread the fires from January into June, so they covered that kind of typical fire season for prescribed burning in the southeast. So some of the burns occurred on the tall timbers fire ecology plot, so they range from one to three year fire return intervals and also plots at uh, Pebble Hill Plantation. And some of the fires were not in research plots. Most of these research plots are about half acre in size, but this just kind of gives an example of the variation in fuel structure from four months post-burn to four years post-burn, where it becomes shrubbier and uh, less herb dominated over time. And like I said before, we uh, measured fires over a range of times of year. so. Uh, part of them were in the growing season, some of them in the dormant season. This is the same plot, just to give you an idea of the percentage of um, cured fuels versus live fuels in these different community situations. And, of course, emission factors ultimately are the, the particulate matter emitted per fuel consumed. And um, it's, generally, it's generally measured using the um, what some call the, the mass balance method or the excess concentration method, where we measure... Uh, gas and particulate matter in the, the fire plume and uh, and also the ambient conditions before the fire and the difference between the, the PM plume and the PM ambient is what we consider to be the particulate matter that was produced by the fire and um, the same way the carbon, total carbon uh, calculated from carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, which is all we measured in this. You know, we didn't um, measure methane and other carbonations um, emissions, but uh, the difference between that measured in the plume and that in ambient was considered to be the emitted carbon dioxide. Now we'll talk a little bit more about that assumption in another part of our study that we'll talk about after uh, after the effects of the environmental conditions on, on emissions. So we actually measured it this way and measured it a, a, a different way as well. So our method for measurement was uh, just you know here I'm using a, this this uh, galvanized pipe that takes a little bit more. So we're measuring at about three meters above the ground. <laughs> 
this counterweighted um, device that we came up with. And then the the uh, PM and gas mixture is piped into our sampling station no more than about 20 meters away in most cases, just using an inline fan. And, uh, you know, if you're interested in all the particular instrumentation we use, you can get in touch with me about it. But um, basically we use this PM sampler, and at the same time within this, uh, well, it's a light, light shade, I guess, uh, w this is where we sampled both the PM as well as carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide, and we, we measured those in Tedlar bags and brought them into the lab for analysis. So it wasn't a real-time analysis, but we uh, sampled them both simultaneously, and, and we used this this baffle or this lampshade just to um, protect the, the sample that was coming out of the tube from, from crosswinds that could disperse it rapidly. So since we measured so many different variables in order to um, to look at their interactions in in a structural equation model, you have to kind of melt down the variables into ones that are correlated with each other. So we just used the principal components analysis um, to do that. And so these circles show what variables we, we kind of grouped together and just picked one of them to be the representative variable. So all these these variables over here, for example, represent fuel load for the most part, so which corresponds closely to heat per unit area, how much woody fuel there was, percent litter, dead fuel, et cetera. Um, these over here are related to time of the year, keach byram drought index or Julian date, um, uh, temperature, and specific humidity. Uh, over here, we had a group that had to do with rate of heat release, so we had wind speed, rate of spread, fire line intensity, direction, just means head fire versus backing fire. And then over here are um, variables that relate to fuel moisture, which include percent live uh, fuel moisture content. And then we put percent grass and percent needles um, on their own is, is just fuel composition. And this is just a, a, an additional axis in the, in the principal components analysis showing that they're, these are kind of separate groups. And of course, we have emission factor itself and then reaction intensity we had as a, as a separate variable in the analysis. And so, you know, once we had calculated our emission factors and took all these measurements, we, we come up with this uh, we come up with this a priori model of how we think the system might be working. So some of these things should be fairly logical, or they were in our mind, that um, perhaps a lot of these variables are affecting emission factors through reaction intensity or that rate of heat release in the combustion process. Uh, but they also might have direct effects as well, so we considered both of those as possible. So things like fuel moisture content, for example, we thought would increase the emission factor. Percent grass, based on past studies, tends to be uh, associated with lower emission factors. Needles are kind of smoky. Uh, direction, the, a one being a head fire, would, would probably increase reaction intensity, and in a, in a backing fire uh, would decrease it, but we weren't really sure about some of these, so we kind of put them either way. Um, and then, you know, we actually ran the model to see what our what our first response is. And these bolded arrows are the ones that were significant in the analysis, and the and the skinny arrows are the ones that are not significant. So some of these were a little surprising. Like one of them, fuel moisture content didn't seem to have any direct effect on emission factors, which we thought it would. Uh, several of these variables had an effect on reaction intensity, but reaction intensity itself had no effect on emission factor either. So whether there's a head fire or a backing fire, whether we had a you know high rate of heat release or a low rate, it, it didn't seem to make that much difference. Some of the variables that did make a difference was this. This is temperature, but that's also correlated with um, later time in the season or, or growing season, higher relative humidities. They did have a positive effect on emission factors. Percent grass had a negative effect like we predicted. Percent needles had a positive effect like we expected. And uh, fuel load itself, it didn't have a direct effect on emission factor, but it did have um, uh, relationships with these with these other variables, and so it had an indirect effect, which you can kind of tease out with the structural equation modeling. Uh, so if you take out the the non-significant um, effects and just leave in the ones that are either important from a direct or an indirect perspective, then you get this kind of simpler model that focuses on those variables I mentioned before. Um, and so, just as some examples of how different different um, environmental conditions influence the emission factor, I just threw out these these cases in which I split the data in half here with the the lower uh, basal area, 8.4 meters squared per hectare on average, or 36 feet squared per acre. 
about 15% pine needles, we had about a 15.4 grams per, per kilogram emission factor. Whereas if we go up to something close to an 80 foot per square, you know, squared feet per acre, which is getting a little bit closer to being a closed canopy pine forest, then, then it goes up, you know, 10 grams per kilogram, just showing that both stocking and as it translates into percent pine needles seems to influence the emission factor, as the structural equation model showed. And then uh, in, in this example, it's just showing the, um, the difference between the, the time of the year, where our, our, our earlier season burns or dormant season burns had a lower emission factor of 18.8 .8 compared to a growing season burn that had a 24.3 uh, grams per, per kilogram. So again, you know, if, um, if these were extrapolated over a, a landscape, they could have a pretty a pretty big effect on a um, on an emissions inventory, depending on uh, what kind of pine tree stocking was was being applied or what time of the year the burns were occurring. And here's another way of looking at the data, just looking at time since fire, and then also whether it's a dormant or growing season burn. So we can see that the lowest emissions were in these uh, annual fires in the dormant season, and conversely, the, the highest emission factors were these three to four year, well, I guess these are one or two year fires, and then these are three or four year fires uh, in the growing season had the highest emission factors. So some conclusions from this part of our study are that the fuel characteristics do seem to have significant effects on, on emission factors for particulate matter 2.5 in these uh, periodically burned southern pine grasslands. The lowest ones were associated with uh, low pine stocking, high grass loads, more frequent burning, and dormant season burns. And so it seems that model, develop, model development for predicting these emission factors based on forest structure you know, like stocking of pine trees and fuel composition, whether it's mostly grass or, or other fuels, uh, should improve the accuracy of, of particulate matter emission estimates in this ecosystem type. Um, also, low emission factor conditions generally corresponded with, with what at least Salt Timber sees as goals for ecological management of this community type, uh, which include thinning pine trees, frequent fire, uh, minimizing broadleaf woody plants with fire and promoting uh, grass-dominated community types. One exception to this might be the dormant season burning. Or, you know, we're not against dormant season burning, but growing season burning has uh, a certain amount of value from an ecological perspective as well. For example, you know, getting wiregrass to flower, uh, providing flowering for a lot of different plants, and and also um, top-killing broadleaf woody plants in a way that, that kind of knocks them back better than than burning in the dormant season. That's kind of the ecological side of things. And effective season on emission factor appears to be because of air moisture rather than fuel moisture. And I actually f forgot to talk about this, but um, well, I mentioned that the the uh, fuel moisture content did not seem to have a direct effect on emission factor, but fuel, but air moisture did. And so it's possible, and we need to kind of tease this apart a little bit more with some more research that it's actually the um, moisture in the air itself that reduces the efficiency of the combustion process and increases the emission factor rather than the moisture in the fuel. Because this research and other research that we've done suggests that uh, by the time these fine fuels Kevin, uh, I'm not hearing Kevin. We Can are anyone here? Norma. Can anyone hear me? I can hear you, but I lost Kevin as well. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, can you hear me now? Phone just, oh, yep. <laughs> You're okay. back. Not sure what happened. Sorry about that. I'm uh, not sure where I cut out, but I was just saying that there's some evidence from this research that rather than the fuel moisture being what causes the emission factor to go up, it might be the moisture in the air itself. Uh, and this has been found with research on combustion engines, for example, that um, cars run less efficiently in the summer because of the moisture in the intake air that absorbs some of the heat uh, during during combustion that causes the combustion process to be less efficient and produce more um, smoke. Uh, and I was just saying this is consistent with other research that we've done that shows that the initial fuel content of these fine fuels that dominate the system don't seem to have an effect on the uh, to on, on the percent fuel consumed or uh, heat per unit area, which suggests that 
because as the flaming front approaches, the, these fine fuels are completely desiccated before they combust, and so that their initial fuel moisture may not have that big an effect, but the time of the year may just because of the atmospheric conditions. Um, that seems to be consistent with these results and other, other research we've done in this system. Um, growing season burns, just kind of advocating for them a little bit to promote grass cover, which over time might offset the higher emission factors for happening in the, in the, um, in the more humid time of the year. And if it's true that it's actually the atmospheric humidity that's causing these burns to be less efficient, then even uh, a burn on a dry day in the growing season may not produce as high of an emission factor. But, you know, in Florida, dry days in the growing season aren't, aren't very common. So we'll probably get, get higher emission factors in, during growing season burns on average, although grassy habitats will, will not be um, quite as high in their emissions. Okay, so that's the, um, the part I think that was advertised, the, the, the fuel conditions effect on emission factors. But I was going to talk a little bit about some of the other research we did on this as well. It's kind of a bonus. Uh, one of the purposes of, uh, of a grant that we got from NSF was to look at this mass balance method or the excess concentration method that's typically used, this one up on top, where you estimate the amount of carbon that's produced uh, from combustion by taking the difference between the, the carbon in the plume and the carbon under ambi ambient conditions, and, um, and actually use an isotopic approach to look at the carbon more directly that's, that's actually um, emitted from the consumption of the fuel and one reason we're interested in doing this is that this this mass balance method can only be depended on if you can assume there's a there's a stoichiometric relationship between the inputs to the combustion and the outputs of the combustion. In other words, every oxygen molecule becomes a carbon dioxide molecule. We know that's not strictly true. I mean, you have carbon monoxide, you have uh, water vapor coming from the combustion environment, and such that there might be a change in the in the carbon dioxide and the uh, change in the concentration of the carbon dioxide in the plume relative to the ambient conditions, um, change in the carbon dioxide that's actually came from the ambient air. Uh, so that that gets a little confusing because I think well it's ambient carbon dioxide in the plume, but the concentration might be different in the plume than it was under ambient conditions. So we thought we would test uh, whether or not the excess concentration or mass balance method assumption is a good one by looking at uh, what's the concentration of carbon in the plume that actually is from ambient, from the ambient air, by looking at uh, its isotopic, uh, its uh, isotopic signature. So we took the, the, the isotopic signature of the carbon in the plume and subtract the ambient signature and then divide that by the um, isotopic signature that we know is from the fuel and subtract that the the uh, signature of ambient and, and these happen to be pretty different the fuel isotopic is about uh, minus you know 27 or so and for ambient carbon dioxide it's uh, it's closer to eight okay so here's some of the results from those burns that we that we uh, measured in the field these curves represent the expected uh, delta 13 for this for these varying total concentrations of carbon dioxide in the plume. So as you get to concentrations that are very near ambient concentrations, then you get a, an isotopic uh, signature that's very close to ambient, which is around that negative eight. But as you get higher and higher concentrations, you get closer to um, the isotopic signature of the fuel itself, which is closer to this you know, 26 to minus 26 to minus 28 range. So that's the relationship that we would expect from our measurements as well, that as you had more carbon dioxide concentration in the plume, that um, you would get this corresponding delta C13 signature. What happened, in fact, is that there seemed to be an overrepresentation of the uh, carbon that came from the ambient air, such that the actual ambient carbon dioxide concentration was increasing in the plume instead of remaining the same, as is the assumption of the uh, mass balance method. So, you know, how could this possibly be? You know, we told this to a lot of people, they're like, well, that, that's impossible. But what we think might be happening based on some past literature that we've looked at is as the ambient air comes in, uh, oxygen is very temporarily, you know, I don't know, nanosecond or something, uh, bound with the carbohydrates in the fuel before the combustion process is completed and releases the carbon dioxide. 
and in that very uh, short time step, the carbon dioxide from the ambient air is able to bypass that process and be entrained in the plume, ultimately at a little bit higher concentration than it than it was, uh, you know, relative to the other gases than it was under ambient conditions. And so um, the result is is that you get this slight offset of uh, between the two methods of, of measuring. And we would argue that the isotopic method is, is the actual real value, as opposed to if this is a one-to-one -one ratio, it would be on this red line. So um, using the excess concentration method or the, uh, the mass balance method, it, it slightly uh, underestimates the emission factor by about 15%. And it's a pretty systematic error that seems to occur. So it's something that could be pretty easily corrected with a, with a correction factor. Uh, another aspect of the research that we did was was testing another assumption of of the mass ba balance method, or, or really, I guess, any um, any method for calculating emission factors, and that is that the ratio of particulate matter to to carbon dioxide uh, released af during combustion remains the same at the place where you measure the particulate matter in the carbon dioxide. So, if there is a differential diffusion of the two then that would undermine the um, assumption that the PM you're measuring and the carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide that you're measuring are representative of the, uh, of the combustion products. So, you know, if you measure it here in the plume with the tower, is it the same as, as, as following combustion? Would it be the same, you know, from an airplane? Would it be the same if we weren't directly in the plume uh, and we're outside on the edge of this, of this um, convection column? So to do that, we uh, did a, a small-scale experiment by just burning wooden blocks uh, from tall timbers in a in a garbage can inside of a uh, racquetball court to to uh, block the side winds here at Florida A&M University. And so we measured the PM in gas simultaneously about 0.3 meters above the the can versus two meters above, and and measured from two different sampling stations the same way we did in the field, but you know at the same time to see if there'd be any difference between the two. In other words, you know, even in this short distance of time, could there be any differential uh, diffusion or dis uh, dispersion, I guess, rather, between the PM and the carbon dioxide? And so here's our setup and, and, and the results. Um, you can see that the, the concentration of particulate matter and of carbon dioxide is about an order of magnitude lower, even just two meters, uh, well, even less than two meters above the other sampling location. However, the emission factor is about the same, so this would support the idea that, that at least over this very short distance, the, um, the, the ratio of PM to carbon dioxide is remaining constant, even as the concentration rapidly decreases as the plume um, disperses, and the MCEs in the, the same neighborhood at least. Uh, we did another experiment where we, I don't have a photograph of it, but we, um, we sampled them side by side at two meters above the flame. So just inside the plume, and then just outside of the plume, about half a meter, 50 centimeters away from the center of the can. And here we got a very different result. We can see that the PM concentrations outside were actually higher than within the plume, which seems kind of counterintuitive. But this is a you know rapidly moving air column, where this is whereas this is stagnant air. And the carbon dioxide concentrations were of course much lower outside of the plume. Uh, modified combustion efficiency was about the same, which suggests that the uh, gas and carbon dioxide were coming from the same combustion source. In other words, we weren't measuring, you know, flaming combustion versus smoldering combustion around the sides of the flame or something like that, which I kind of initially thought when we first got this result. But the emission factor is very different. It's about a nine times higher particulate matter, particulate matter emission factor um, just outside of the plume than inside of the plume. So it seems like there's, um, you know, given the fact that all of these measurements were taken within about 45 minutes of um, of us lighting the fire, it seems like the this differential uh, uh, dispersion of the particulate matter and the gases is, is happening pretty quickly outside of the uh, convection column. So there might be some turbulent eddies going on here that that create this low in energy mixing environment that cause the two to separate. Um, and so we certainly don't want to measure there. This is uh, some thermograms that we took of the particulate matter itself that were sampled from these locations. And I won't go too much into this MESTA um, analysis system that, that Ping Shade and his colleagues came up with. But basically, these, uh, the, the location of these peaks as you, you take the uh, particulate matter from the, the pre-baked quartz filter and heat it up, you, you get 
emissions of different gases at different temperatures. And, um, and we found from previous research that there's a different signature for smoldering versus flaming combustion. And um, both of these signatures are within this range of flaming combustion, where if we measured 0.3 meters versus 2 meters above, they, the carbon peaks at the same place. And also, if we measure within the column and outside the column, it also peaks in about the same place. So similar to the um, MCE values, this just suggests that the, that the, uh, the gases are coming from the same uh, emission source. It's not, we're not measuring flaming versus smoldering combustion, but we're, we're, we're measuring uh, decoupling of the carbon dioxide and the gases, presumably because of uh, this lower energy environment outside of the convection column. So some overall conclusions from, from that line of work are that the uh, ambient carbon dioxide concentrations seem to be increased in the fire plume relative to the ambient air conditions. And uh, there's a non-sorchiometric relationship between the ambient carbon dioxide and oxygen that's going into the combustion environment and the gaseous products of combustion that are resulting. Uh, and and that causes a, a bias of about 15% underestimation of emission factor if you use the traditional mass balance method. So it could be, um, you know, corrected. And, you know, some more, uh, some more empirical research would be helpful to kind of tack that down. But um, the assumption that emitted particulate matter and carbon dioxide are well mixed does seem to hold true, but only within the flaming combustion convection column, which I don't suppose is too surprising, but it, it's good to know that to make sure that when we're measuring that we're within that hot rising column. And conversely, the uh, emitted particulate matter and carbon dioxide are rapidly decoupled. Um, and, you know, we, we measured carbon monoxide in these studies, too, and combined the two. I've just been kind of using carbon dioxide as, as sort of shorthand. But they're ra rather rapidly decoupled. All this happened in less than an hour uh, where the convective mixing is weak. And such uh, weak convective conditions might include the turbulent edges and the exterior of the convection column and uh, maybe convection from low energy combustion, like from a very low intensity flaming or smoldering combustion situation. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Um, we had funding from National Science Foundation and also from Tall Timbers and several people helping with the, the burning and measurement and fuel measurement and, and everything that was you know, somewhat labor intensive, a lot of work going into each individual burn. So you know our, our sample sizes were not tremendous. I actually didn't mention that, but the uh, structural equation model was based on a sample size of about 50 burns. And so again, we're just kind of looking at these concepts and not claiming to have established a generalizable model that's ready to use. But um, I think the results do suggest that, that such a kind of larger scale empirical measurement of burns under different conditions to develop a model might be worthwhile for doing a better job of, um, of calculating our emission inventories and using appropriate emission factors for different uh, burning conditions in the southeast. So I'll stop there and see if there are um, any questions. I haven't seen any pop up. Kevin, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for the bonus material as well. Um, you did, went further than what I remembered from AFE. Um, had a little bit more time, too. So yeah, thank you. Uh, some of the last stuff that you put up there was kind of compelling. Um, <laughs> so. Um, Folks, uh, opportunity for questions. Dead silence. They're, they're all that asleep. Generally means, <laughs> that, no, no, that generally means that everyone's now saying, well, geez, I think I can go back and listen to it again, and then I'll have my questions. <laughs> I don't know. That has come up a couple of times. Um, Any implications from, any, you know, we're about to engage in a dialogue next Wednesday in the conference. I don't think you're attending, are you, Kevin? I don't, I don't think you were making No, I'm not gonna. I'm not going to be there, unfortunately. Okay, well, I hope you think about attending our International Spoke Symposium in the fall. I'm sure you've heard about that already. Um, yes, sir. So, yeah, hopefully you can make that. So, okay. um, as you think about... One of the questions that we have, and this is part of the reason why I was looking to have you um, speak to us, is Sean, has, Sean Urbanski has put together a bunch of uh, a paper. I want to say it was published last year, if I'm not mistaken, or either late in 14 or early 15. I can't remember which. Um, and there's been a lot of aerial measurements that are going on. 
Um, there's kind of a history of, you know, lab burns and then also institute stuff with, you know, Daryl Ward and all the other history that you know about uh, right. how it started in the southeast. Um, and, you know, there's – so there's kind of three different methodologies that are kind of out there. Um, you know, some of the stuff that you've picked, you know, you've brought to our attention here kind of has some implications on this. And so I was just kind of wondering if there's any thoughts as you look at these different techniques um, or limitations – of, of your work that we should think about as well. I'm just going to, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're trying to figure our way out of what is the best approach because, you know, if we utilize some of the um, recommended approaches that Sean has given us as a group, um, it results in a PM 2.5 change for our national emission inventory of for fire. And this is kind of collective. This is ag burning and wildfire and prescribed fire. Mm -hmm. And, it goes from, I think it was like somewhere like around 35%, 33%, up to almost 48% or some range in there, but basically like a 10 or 12% increase because of some of the different numbers and the new VOCs and, and, and some of the other different factors. But bottom line, PM2.5 would dramatically, just the, the amount that we were contributing to the, to the annual emission inventory would substantially increase. And Substantially um, increase if, if what now? If we utilized um, the approach that Sean had put in his paper on emission factors, and so in, in briefly, there, what was what was Sean's proposed Sean method? On, How are they Sean joining us actually. Okay. But a, a lot of it, and maybe Susan is on. Susan. <laughs> yes, I'm here. Um, so yes. summarizing a, a couple sentences, part of the approach, and I, I was just trying to lead into kind of a dialogue to generate thoughts for next week. So I think you know where yeah. I was going. Yeah, I do. Thanks. Um, yeah, so Sean, um, Sean wrote a paper, let's see, it was 2014, and it was a um, consolidation analysis of emission factor research. So um, it contains information about, um, well, probably close to 200 VOC species in there, but also, you know, carbon, the carbon species, PM2.5. And in there, um, there's broad categories of Broad categories of vegetation. There's, a, I think, five broad categories of vegetation, and um, so, and then a lumping of the flaming and smoldering combustion phases together, and then um, there was another, um, and then residual smoldering, longer-term smoldering, was its own combustion phase. So, anyway, it's just a way of analyzing the emission factor data that's out there, especially with emphasis on what's been going on the last 10 years, and um, you know, pulling it together and summarizing it. And so, if we apply that, those updated factors um, versus uh, to emissions calculations, such as what's mm -hmm. done in the NEI, then, like for example, PM 2.5 could easily go up by a factor by 50% or could even double depending on, you know, exactly what decisions you make. But definitely a big – we could be looking at a big increase in um, PM 2.5 just based on updating emission factors. And this is updating emission factors from what's um, been used from, like, 30 years ago from a lot of um, Daryl Ward's research and others there. So um, – and what's, like, in the 2001 Smoke Management Guide. So we're just yeah. Kind I of apologize that I haven't read that. that. And, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think yeah, I definitely I need to read that. Numbers, I just haven't yet, so I can't talk to it. Yeah, yeah. I know. I realize that. So it's but it's just um, I think what you're and kind of I think what you're showing you know a lot of the mission factor data that you're calculating I think falls in line kind of with that trend of I mean the numbers are are bigger than what might have been um, measured 30 years ago. Yeah, and you know, it's a kind of a general trend, and I don't know if the Urbanski paper talks about this too. Is that the measurements that are taken from the ground tend to be a little bit higher, and it could be because of like what we're picking up on this uh, differential diffusion of carbon dioxide from the uh, particulate matter that kind of hangs around. It could be kind of contaminating the uh, the samples that are close to the ground. You know, and I think that's one thing that's been suggested. Whereas if you get higher up, you're sampling more what's getting kind of pulled up into that convection column and maybe a little bit better mixed. But, you know, we don't really have the evidence to pin that down for sure yet. 
Mm-hmm. And Sean's made the argument, too, that the stuff that's more lofted might be what you're most interested in. It's just likely to go the longest distance as well. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of yeah. thoughts there. You could, I mean, you know, and that, that actually was one of the one of the points that we started down was, you know, there's lots of different uses for emission factor information. Um, you know, people calculate uh, fees right. for it in some locations. Others, you know, are using it for making a go no go decision for short range impact um, on you know on communities, which is more like the southeast in some ways. And then there's longer range modeling and certainly you know get up to the IPCC level, um, where you know we're talking about global emissions or you know what kind of resolutions needed for all of them. And um, and those are all substantial questions. Um, but, um, you know, so the, there's kind of some, we're, we're kind of hitting a, a question of what is, you know, what should be our pathway here? Because my own personal research is, I mean, I've kind of been going to lead the panel next week, and, and I've been collecting data of different activity levels, variance, and different ways of calculating the emissions and different ways they're used in the same year. And, you know, when you all of a sudden come up with like seven different inventories potentially for the same year, mm -hmm. you kind of go, well, somewhere along the line, we probably ought to be talking about some standardization because I don't know how you represent what we're doing with, without at least knowing the balance. And um, so I've got, you know, so I'm certainly seeing it from a policy level, which of course, you know, I'm good at. Um, and, and so we're just trying to explore that, and that's where the smoke committee also kind of rests in kind of science and then, you know, taking into consideration some of the, the policy implications of some of these things. So there's Yeah, that's why emission factor is such a slippery eel because it's not even really a consensus on what the emission factor is. Like Just like you said, you know, what purpose are you measuring it for? You know, what location? And I think for the same fire, you would get a lot of different emission factors depending on what you're applying it to. Yeah. Whether it's yeah. you know what people are breathing who are setting the fire, or you know how much smoke's getting on a highway next door, or how much is going to end up in New Jersey or whatever. Yeah. Well, good news is that you guys shouldn't get to New Jersey. But um, so, uh, Susan, any um, any follow up to to uh, to Kevin's work here that that um, you know with that mindset of, of talking further about uh, you know creating at least a pathway or an identification of key things that we should be considering next week. Yeah, I think I'm still at the phase of taking it all in. Um, but, th yeah, this is really interesting stuff. And I guess my perspective, what I kind of struggle with is, from a modeling standpoint, what are, what are, the, you know, what are the numbers that should be plugged into different models? And, um, and then, you know, mention the different needs that these models try to meet. And, you know, they're very, you know, they're wide ranging. And so typically we're used to thinking about emission factors in terms of combustion phase and vegetation type, but it seems that um, it, it's more complex than that. And I think, Kevin, your, re your research really illustrates that and um, the analysis you did, the principal component analysis, I think kind of uh, really illustrates that too. So I'm just trying to kind of get my mind around, you know, what we're traditionally used to working with and perhaps where we need to start thinking instead in the future. Yeah, there might be some key variables that are the most valuable to focus in on, and I'm thinking that maybe even just uh, pine tree basal area, you know, stocking might be real important. And that's the kind of thing that people who are authorizing burns in the southeast uh, could easily ask if it were part of their protocol and it could help. You know, they do ask what kind of fuel you're burning, but that's something that landowners almost invariably know about their property, you know, how many pine trees, because it seems like needles are just really smoky. I mean, there's that one study that shows that the emission factor for pine needles was something like seven times as high as it was for grass. And uh, conversely, the fewer pines you have, the more grassy fuels you're going to tend to have if you've been burning frequently. So there might be some, you know, if there's just a handful of variables that could get us closer, it could be helpful. So I sure appreciate your time and effort here and sharing this with uh, everyone. Um, and it's doing exactly what I wanted, which is, you know, creating a compelling thought process for folks like Susan who are real important in this and, uh, 
you know, I'm sure that we'll, we'll guide Sean to take a look at this as well. Um, when we, you know, and anyone else is going to be there next week, that I, that I think it's really worthwhile to take a look at, you know, what we're seeing here and that it does have some really, you know, good value in, in trying to understand how we move forward on some of these issues. And we decide to, you know, take on this kind of thorny question. Um, so, any other questions before we before we wrap it up? Your beeps. <laughs> <I'm not> <laughs> <laughs> Take that as a no. Huh? Yeah. Well, Kevin, I sure appreciate it. Um, and now that we've recorded it, um, this has even more value for for everyone. Truthfully, um, you know, the opportunity to, to capture this kind of information for the small audience that we had here, but also the audience that you have in the Southeast. So we'll, we'll do some, make some efforts with your folks over at your, your compatriot over at the, at the, um, uh, with the fire science exchange there that's, that's located there. And, you know, let's, uh, let's see if we can, you know, get some other people, you know, tracking this. Thank you very much to CNC for, you know, stepping in and picking up the, the capability to do this shortly. Um, I think, you know, we're going to need to really investigate and it's going to be a, a significant dialogue for lots of folks coming to the end of, and, and, and I say that kind of tongue in cheek. I, I kind of was about to say the end of trying to come to some conclusions. We may come to some conclusions that are, we don't know as much as we think we know, and we need to do X, Y, and Z. And I, kind of one of the implications that you just kind of alluded to is, you know, where, <laughs> what do we know and what perhaps don't we? Um, and so I look forward to the dialogue next week. Um, I wish you were there because I think you would actually be really valuable contributing, but we are going to try and capture some of our thoughts. Um, and, you know, I offer you, you know, take a look at Sean's paper. Um, yeah, I definitely and will. If you, have, if you have thoughts, um, you know, we want to hear them. Um, this, is, this is meant to be a scientific policy dialogue. Of, of trying to move this forward. And, 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 you know, we need to inform it because, I mean, we're doing emission factors because we care about what the effects are on the health downwind. And that's a policy-driven decision. So, you know, trying to move that forward is, is real important. And, you know, I just, um, I just got to tell you that I sure appreciate your time here and um, incredibly valuable and incredibly useful. Um, so. Okay. Well, thanks for the invitation. Any and, um, I'll be happy to answer, uh, you know, if anybody wants to write me, email me or anything, or get copies of, um, of one of our papers published, the other one submitted right now. But either way. <laughs>